Okay, I'm, I'm just going to read a, a few paragraphs from my book, uh, The Last Days of Shea. I'm going to read um, the last portion of a, an essay called The Last Game, and it's about the very last game that was played at Shea Stadium, um, a game that the Mets lost. And because they lost, they were not going to be going to the playoffs. Had they won the game, they would have been. Um, well, they would have at least tied um, and then had a one-game playoff against the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, the context of this, though, is that no matter whether the Mets won or lost, there was going to be a ceremony to commemorate the fact that this was the last game at Shea. And the Mets had invited 50 of the most important Mets to come to the stadium. And at a very compelling and tearful moment, these 50 men came down uh, out of the bullpens and came down to, to the field and formed an archway on the field. And um, I was watching them do this. And uh, there is a passage in where I give all their names. It's a kind of almost a sacred list to me. Um, I'm not going to read that sacred list. What I'm going to read is what my feelings were as I looked at these men on the field. There they were, on the base paths, these deep and close friends I had never met. There were the larger-than-life figures who lived in a special dream world in the mind of millions. There was a man who made me so happy when he hit a home run as I was listening to the family car radio during an intermission between features at the Paramus Drive-In Theater. There was someone who had made me cry when he came back after six years of unforgivable, unforgivable banishment. There was someone who had played on the Mets from the time I was in the second grade until the year I got married. There was a man who made me smile as a kid because he didn't look, act, or talk like any other ball player. There was a shy man no one had seen in years who was the single most exciting player I have ever seen play. There was a chunk of my life down on that field. There were the artists who made something that would always be more than a game to me. They were all lined up, and I watched them through my binoculars. I saw the old teams come together again, particularly the great team of the 80s, the team that is about my age. I saw the older team of grown men from the impossibly distant days when I first heard Bob Murphy's voice. And I saw the newer Mets, who were young enough for my daughter to have fallen in love with. Each of them stood on the field in a big jersey with a number he had worn. And then as the music changed to the kind of music they play at the victory celebration at the end of Star Wars, I saw each of them come forward to touch home plate and wave to the crowd. The vast concourse of the wounded cheered as if nothing had happened that afternoon. All that mattered was a half century of warm and briny love. All that mattered was them and us. Then there was the ceremony where Tom Seaver threw one last pitch to Mike Piazza. There was the last pitch that would be thrown from that mound. There was the last pitch caught. Seaver and Piazza put their arms around each other and waved and then walked out to deep center. They stopped before the wall and waved again. The blue wall opened up and took them in. It was over, and our tears of love mixed with our tears of bitterness. The Mets were gone, but people stayed, looking, sitting, standing, taking pictures. I looked around and I couldn't believe that I would never see this broad, warm, familiar sight again. It was not really there anymore. It was behind the blue wall with Tom and Mike. Yet as I walked down the ramps for the very last time, the stadium felt eerily alive to me. It seemed as if it was dying as people actually die, with love, generosity, and an uncanny alertness. When I was finally outside, I looked up at the neon ghosts on the side of the building, hitting and pitching and fielding. I walked towards the parking lot by the bay, turning around every few seconds. After I passed under the Whitestone Expressway, I couldn't see the stadium anymore when I turned back towards it. I walked through the darkness of the nearly empty parking lot to my car. Not wanting to get into the car right away, I walked to the promenade along the bay and sat down on a bench. I could see the lights of LaGuardia Airport and their reflections, shimmering columns in the black water. 
To the left, I saw the top of the Empire State Building, and off to the right in the distance was the Triborough Bridge, with its lights like the strands of a necklace. I thought of how we used to drive over the bridge in the 1960s, how I used to look between the backs of my parents' heads to get my first glimpse of Shea. I thought of how I used to show the bridge to my infant daughter. We could see it from her very first bedroom in Astoria. Standing with my help on my lap, she would look at the bridge as if she could see that something was there, but she didn't know what it was or what it meant. I looked at the lights in the water and against the night sky. I knew that Shea was empty, but all of its lights were still on. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it behind me.